Um, yeah, as Pete mentioned this morning, we're in a series called COVID Can't Feel Christmas. Um, last week, Pete talked a bit about interrupted plans uh, and how particularly in the Christmas story there were some plans that were interrupted that uh, clearly showed that God was at work for his greater good. Uh, Pete encouraged us encouraged us to look at that this time of year uh, with COVID and um, to be adaptable, to bless others, and to remember that Christmas is about Christ, um, which can be an easy thing to be kind of put to the side in all the hustle and bustle and busyness at the end of the year and everything that comes along with that. Um, I would just like to get a volunteer, and Jono, that's you. <laughs> and uh, full credit to Pete, I learned that trick from him. Uh, uh. <laughs> um, this is uh, an interactive part of the service. I want to brainstorm some words that describe Christmas, and John is going to write them on me. <laughs> or the whiteboard that's just over there. Uh, so, Jeff. Joy. Joy. Joy describes Christmas. Uh, J O Y. <laughs> uh, more words. Simple words. <laughs> yes. Three letters or less, please. Peace. Peace. Okay, Jeff's doing all the hard work here. Love. Joy, peace, love. I'd agree with all of those. Any more that spring to mind? Sharing. Sharing. Thank you, sweetheart. Food. 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 Yeah.
would be based on the fact that Jesus came to earth. Now, the reason for Christmas is bigger. It's because he came to earth. It's because he came to earth to die in our place on the cross. And so the birth of Jesus is certainly something to celebrate, but we celebrate it because of what it means to come uh, in the life of Jesus. I want to speak this morning about three things that speak to that point. And I can get my clicker working. There we go. The first one is Old Testament prophecy. So Pete talked about it last week and he's mentioned it this morning that all throughout the Old Testament there have been prophecies speaking about Jesus, the Messiah, the promised Saviour, the promised one who would come. Um, Pete even read one out from Isaiah 9 this morning. Um, the next one is what's called typology, um, which I had to do a little bit of research on, but this is the idea of foreshadowing, the things that we read about in the Old Testament that create uh, a symbol or an image that point to Christ. And the third one actually is Christmas itself, which I think is both of those things, is prophecy fulfilled and it's also a foreshadowing and all of it points to the cross. So firstly, some Old Testament prophecy. And uh, I'm just going to come down at it and I'm going to swap you the clicker for the mouse if that's okay. That's okay. I've got a few clicks in there, so sorry for the interruption. There we go, that's a bit better. Uh, prophecy from the Old Testament. I've got this verse from Genesis chapter 3, which seems like an interesting place to start a Christmas message. Um, but I think this is the first prophecy that I could find that directly speaks to Jesus. And it comes from 3.15, and it's God saying to the serpent, or to Satan, I will make enemies of you and the woman, and of your offspring and her descendant, he, meaning Jesus, shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now this is straight after Adam and Eve decided in their own wisdom that they would like to stop following God, to stop pursuing him and obeying him and go their own way. And at that point when they created a fracture in the relationship between God and them, God came in straight away. He didn't have to go back and think about it. He didn't have to go and sit down and think, what am I going to do now? These human beings are a bit silly and they've gone and disobeyed me. He came in straight away and he said, I've got a plan to fix this problem. And this problem involves my son, who I'm going to send. And it's interesting that he speaks about Jesus as being her descendant, talking about the woman, which from a, from a biological perspective is exactly right. Um, in Mary, and that speaks to the incarnation of the virgin birth um, that was to come. And so here God's stepping in from the very first prophecy about Jesus in the Old Testament, and he's saying, I'm going to intervene to put an end to and destroy the work of the devil that the devil had just clearly displayed. A man named John Gill uh, said this, from this first prophecy, we learn that the Messiah was to be incarnate, born of a woman and not begotten by man. He was to suffer and die, and also he was to destroy Satan and his works, which Jesus has done. Uh, and I'll add to that, and I'll say it was also to take the wrath of God that he deserved upon himself on the cross. There's a man who since passed away, but his name was Peter Stoner. And he was a mathematician and astrophysicist, which is a pretty good resume, I think. Um, and he wanted to do a study on Old Testament prophecy, and he wanted to kind of come up with a means of displaying what would the likelihood be of all of these Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus. What is the likelihood that they could all be fulfilled by one man? And he started out by looking at eight in particular. And they were that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. That comes from the book of Micah. 
that he would enter Jerusalem as a king riding on a donkey. Uh, it comes from the book of Zechariah. That he would be betrayed by a friend and suffer wounds in his hands. That comes from the book of Zechariah. That he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, quite specific. Even more specific is then that that money would be used to purchase a potter's field, also in Zechariah. Um, from the famous passage in Isaiah 53, that he would remain silent as he suffered. That he would die by having his hands and his feet pierced, Psalm 22. And that a messenger would prepare the way for him. And that comes from the Italian prophet Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 1. Now, you can look into Peter Stoner's reasoning and his numbers, and it's incredible, and all of all of his logic is there to be found. If you research him on the internet, you can find a whole telling of how he came up with these numbers. I won't bore you with that now, but what I do want to give you is the number that he came up with for the odds of those eight prophecies being fulfilled, not just that they were fulfilled, but that they were fulfilled by one person. And the magic number is 1 in 10 to the power of 17, or that's 1 with 18 zeros after it, or 1 quintillion. Um, just for the record, you have about a 1 in 8 million chance of winning the lotto in Australia. So, that number, I, I look at all of those zeros and I get a bit lost. Um, now, the example that he gave, he said to put it in kind of a relatable term, he said, and being American, this would apply to him. Has anybody been to Texas? Yep, yeah, by America. Oh, the rich hotel. It's a big place from what I hear. Not as big as New South Wales. Not as big as New South Wales. <laughs> 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 That is so Australian. <laughs> this is pretty good. The yeah, house is a bit bigger though. <laughs> anyway, Texas, although it's not as big as New South Wales, is still a big place. And what Peter Stoner came up with was that if you got uh, some American $1 coins and painted one of them, and you covered the state of Texas in $1 coins, two feet deep, and then blindfolded somebody and sent them out into Texas and said, can you find me that one painted coin? That is the likelihood that this astrophysicist came up with that these eight prophecies could be fulfilled by one person. Now, there are over 350 prophecies in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the New Testament relating to Jesus. So if that's the odds for eight of those prophecies, I, I need to stop there because I can't think past these numbers. But what does that tell us? It tells us that, well, one, we can trust Scripture, but it also speaks to the incredible, perfect plan that God had from the beginning, from that very moment of the first prophecy when he said, I am going to put this plan in place to redeem humans to myself. And here we are, over a thousand years, when the Old Testament was written, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, and then being fulfilled. And of course there's prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet because it relates to Christ's second coming as well. Um, and this just speaks to more evidence that we can trust that as well. So I believe that when we get to the Christmas story, based on the prophecies of Jesus, this is just the beginning of something incredible that God had planned. The second thing I want to speak to is typology or symbols. Um, another word you could use is foreshadowing. And I noticed that Pete, this morning in the, in the songs, did a little bit of foreshadowing to help me while I was clicking, because we're a little bit rusty on the data. Um, but Pete would speak kind of what the next verse was going to be. Um, to lead us in as a congregation, to lead us to that verse in the song. And so the idea of typology in scripture is that there are people, there are objects, there are events <coughs> that happen that point to the actual event. So short of specific prophecy that we've just read about, there's 
types, and some of those types um, are Moses, Joseph, and David, some of the objects of the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and some of the events are the story of Abraham and Isaac, the bronze serpent that Moses made for the Israelites, uh, and the Passover event. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so the things that we read about, these things that we call types or symbols, are written as examples. And when we look at them, we can see God's hand in orchestrating these events to point to something greater. So I'm only going to look at those three events that I've got listed this morning. And firstly, we're looking at Abraham and Isaac, which is a familiar story where God asks Abraham to take his only son, Isaac, uh, up the mountain and to put him on the altar to sacrifice him. Now, of course, we know that God intervenes and stops. Um, but it was a display of Abraham's faith in God that he trusted God because Isaac said, where's the offering? And um, Abraham said, God will provide that offering. So the similarities we see here in pointing uh, towards the life of Christ is that Isaac was also a son of promise. Remember that, Isaac, uh, that Abraham uh, was quite old and Sarah was quite old and they, it was very unlikely that they could have a baby. So the fact that they did was a miracle in itself. But God had promised that earlier. Um, Abraham was asked to offer his only son. So there's a picture of the father offering his only son as a sacrifice. But then the other side of that is that God actually provided the lamb, and that's what God did for us in providing Jesus, was that he provided the lamb for us that we needed to be sacrificed on our behalf. Um, I love how the King James Version puts it when Isaac asks Abraham, hey, Dad, Where's the offering? We've got this altar and we're good to go. Where's the offering? And the King James Version says that Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And I, I love that thought. God will provide himself as an offering. The second event. Uh, that I see as symbolism towards um, our redemption story is the bronze serpent uh, in the wilderness. So the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness as they did for 40 years. Moses is leading them and the Israelites start complaining. And have you ever been that hungry and hot that you get really irrational? They started saying things like, have you brought us out here to die? Things were better back in Egypt when we were slaves. At least we got fed the kind of things that they were coming up with. And so, God, in this story, God sends um, snakes into the camp of the Israelites, and the snakes start biting people, and people start dying. And the Israelites come to Moses, and they say, Moses, can you intercede for us? Can you talk to God? We need to do something about this. And so they've recognised their sin, and they've come to Moses, and Moses has gone to God. God said, I want you to take a serpent, uh, a bronze serpent or a brazen serpent, I want you to put it on a pole. Um, and we read in Numbers that whoever looked at that symbol was saved from their snake bite. Now obviously looking at a snake on a pole, there's nothing medical about that, but it's a display of one repentance and it's a display of faith in what God had promised to do. So here we have the Israelites rebelling against God. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I've certainly rebelled against God. And uh, I've probably been way more irrational than the Israelites were, so I'm not criticising them. Um, there was consequence for their sin. And as such, they recognised that they needed, they needed help. They needed God's help. And so they approached Moses as an intercessor and said, can you talk to God on our behalf? And I love that picture because... When we recognise our sin, when we recognise our need for a saviour, we go to Christ and he intercedes for us. And when we look to the cross and him being nailed to the cross, that's where our salvation comes from, by faith and 
and trust in what Christ did on the cross. So all who looked up at the bronze serpent were saved. And even Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life in him. So it's a very clear um, picture of Jesus saying, that happened in the past, and just like that happened, I need to be lifted up onto the cross um, to redeem those who believe. The third type or symbol um, is the Passover event, which is a, a quite a familiar one to, to us. We know that um, there are a number of plagues in Egypt, and Pharaoh was very stubborn, and he wasn't ready to let God's people go. And so the last of those was that God would send an angel of judgment through Egypt and kill the firstborn of every family, except for those who took a lamb for their household. In fact, this is what God told the Israelites to do, was to take a lamb for your household. The lamb needed to be unblemished. They were to take the blood of the lamb and they were to put it on the two doorposts and the lintel. And if you were to draw that on the doorway, it might look something like this point, the opposite point, and the top point of a doorway. And so it was the blood of the lamb that enabled God's judgment to pass over that household. Um, I'd encourage you to have a look at the book of Hebrews, particularly chapter 9 and 10, which talks a lot about um, the new covenant and the fact that Jesus shed his blood and that all of these Old Testament things could stop. They had to happen repeatedly, but that Jesus died, shed his blood, and that was the final sacrifice. And in Hebrews 10 it says that where there is forgiveness uh, of these things and offering for sin is no longer required. So the Passover points to Jesus once again in that the lamb needed to be unblemished. And we know that the Lord Jesus, his life was perfect. He was sinless. So he went to the cross as an unblemished lamb. He shed his blood and because of the blood that was shed for us, God doesn't pass our judgment, but what he did was he put that judgment on Christ, on the cross, so that we could step into freedom, so that we could live as free from our sinful nature, as, as forgiven and loved and as children of God. And so that's just three things in the Old Testament um, that point to Christ. And there's many more, and uh, I won't go into them now. But that brings us to the Christmas event in itself. I'll go to the next slide, thanks Adam. I've lost my clicker. So we've got prophecy in the Old Testament, we've got symbolism and foreshadowing in the Old Testament that all leads us to Christ, and I want to suggest that Christmas is actually both of those things. It's fulfillment of prophecy, not all of the Old Testament prophecy, but certainly a lot of the Old Testament prophecy that talked about Jesus' birth. Um, but it's also appointed to the cross. And I love that even in the Christmas story, there's another little mini Christmas story that's a foreshadowing as well, because uh, Pete mentioned last week the prophecy, and, and we talked about it just before, that Jesus would have a messenger go before him. And in Luke chapter 1, you read about Zachariah and Elizabeth, who... Once again, a very old, they can't conceive, but God promises them a son, and that son will be John the Baptist, and he will go before Jesus. And um, you know, Zechariah was doubtful about that, and he even said to the angel, he said, that can't happen, I'm too old, and my wife, she's too, well, she's advanced in years, that's what he said. I wasn't going to say she was old. <laughs> <laughs> he knew where his bread was buttered. <laughs> But he did, you look it up, that's what he says. He says, I'm old and my wife, she's advanced. But what happens is that even in his doubt, God fulfills the promise to send a messenger, to send somebody that leads the way before Jesus. And that miracle birth in itself um, is a foreshadowing of the miracle birth that was about to happen, except it was an even greater miracle 
um, because Mary wasn't married, she was a virgin. And only, only God can make that happen, and it just proves the divinity of Christ. Next slide, thanks, Adam. This is what it looks like when a new iPhone gets released. <clears throat> Apparently, the newer iPhone makes calls better than the older iPhone, and it's enough to make you want to camp out for days. At this event, I'm not sure which iPhone it was, but one of the um, one of the media that one of the media representatives that was there uh, is quoted as saying. Uh, the witnesses noticed that the management wasn't able to control over-enthusiastic patrons who pushed, shouted, and yelled their way into the line. For an iPhone that obviously raises your children and cures cancer. <laughs> I don't understand that. But the idea of Advent, um, I looked up the word Advent, and uh, it's described as something finally being. And, uh, you know, I know that this time of year you go to the shops and you'll see all of those calendars with 24 days on them and each day you open, open a, uh, a little window and you get a chocolate. And Pete, I've even seen a King Chrome one at Bunnings oh, yeah. that you open and you get like a little tool each day. So June, I'm not hinting at anything for next year, but there's an idea. But that idea of building up, that idea of anticipation leading to something, and we've seen that as we've just looked at in the prophecy of the Old Testament, that there was this period of time from the beginning that something had to happen, and there was a period of waiting. Now, in the Christmas story, we do see that there are people who either, one, weren't receptive to the birth of Jesus, and I'm thinking of Herod in particular. There were religious teachers and scholars who knew the Old Testament but didn't recognise Jesus. But then there were the shepherds, and the Magi who heard about Jesus, and they were straight to go and see him, the shepherds in particular, because they went that night. And the Magi took a few years, which to me suggests was a long way to travel. Now, you're not going to travel a long way like that for an iPhone. Uh, but when the Messiah has been born and you want to go and worship him, which is exactly what they said they wanted to do, then you will travel then you will sacrifice because the anticipation is there. It's finally happened. God's promises are finally coming to fruition. Now the Magi, thanks Adam, the Magi, um, you can click all of those three up too, thanks Adam, um, come with three gifts and we all know the gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. So I did a little bit of uh, research into what these things represented because they're very specific gifts. And um, I found out that gold represents royalty and kingship, which is which is obvious. Uh, it's very valuable. Uh, frankincense being an incense, uh, the idea there is that it represented worship. Um, the Magi said that they had come to worship the Lord. Now, it's not 100% sure where they're religious affiliation was at that time, but they clearly knew that Jesus was worthy of worship. And so they bought frankincense. And the third item that they bought was myrrh. Uh, and that was a key ingredient in burial spices. And so even here, in the gifts that the Magi bring, we see a representation of, of Christ and his kingship, of his worthiness for our worship. But we also see a foreshadowing to the fact that he needs to die. And this baby, was he was here for a purpose, and that purpose was, yes, it was to live for 33 years, yes, it was to teach, yes, it was to be perfect, but ultimately it was to be that lamb that we spoke about on the cross. It's interesting, there's another prophecy in Isaiah, and it's from chapter 60, and it talks about Christ coming and being given the gift of gold and frankincense. But it doesn't talk about myrrh. Uh, and a little bit of digging, I realised that Isaiah 60 is actually talking about Christ's second coming. And so William MacDonald says that, note that in Isaiah 60, myrrh is missing in verse 6 because myrrh speaks of suffering. 
Christ's atoning sufferings are finished forever. At his second advent, advent, there will be only gold and frankincense, glory and fragrance. And I just think that is that's a beautiful picture. Um, they're speaking to Christ on the cross for us. Uh, next slide, next Adam. So what does Christmas mean? So just looking back at that very first prophecy, Adam and Eve have sinned, the relationship between God and mankind is fractured, and God says to the serpent, I'll make enemies of you and the woman and of your offspring and her descendant. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So with God's plan from the beginning, through the Old Testament, through the prophecies, through the foreshadowing, through the symbolism, through the anticipation of the Messiah, and through that representation of the gifts of the Magi, what does Christmas mean to us? And I think that all of these words, I mean, maybe people put out consumerism as something that we've thrown in <laughs> in our day and age, but joy, peace, love, sharing, uh, presence, Christmas spirit, Family, rejoicing, calorie, calories, uh, thanksgiving. All of those things are summed up in what we've just talked about. But I want to add one more word that's not there. I want to add the word destruction. Uh, Adam, could you go to the next one and the next verse, please? In 1 John 3 8, we're told that the Son of God appeared for this purpose destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? If you read 1 John chapter 3, it's very clear that the works of the devil that this is talking about is sin. And that's exactly what triggered this whole thing from the beginning, was Adam and Eve's sin. And our sin meant that God needed to institute a So the devil is the one that God actually spoke to at the beginning. And he said, your work's not going to prevail because I'm going to send somebody that's going to bruise your head and that's going to destroy your work, that's going to redeem mankind to us. So when we look at that promise of God, when we look through the prophecy and we come to Jesus' birth, we then move from his birth at Christmas time, which is what we remember now, and we look forward to Easter time when he was put on the cross as that unblemished lamb. But, but as I said, those prophecies aren't all fulfilled yet because there are so many prophecies in scripture about Christ's second coming. And what God and what Jesus asked his followers to do was to take communion in remembrance of him, in remembrance of that sacrifice that was offered uh, on our behalf for all who put our trust in him and all who believe and look to him to the cross for our redemption and uh, he said to do this until I come back and so um, Pete's going to come up and we're going to go into communion and just before Pete does I'll close in prayer Heavenly Father we thank you that we have the privilege uh, at this point in time where we can have a Bible in front of us and we can see from the very beginning your plan to redeem us. Lord, we thank you that as we come to Christmas, we are celebrating an event. We are celebrating the birth of the promised Messiah. And it doesn't end at the birth because we look forward to the cross where your son was crucified, where he shed his blood for our sin. But it doesn't end there because he rose again and he had the victory. Thank you that that victory is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ because of what happened on the cross. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we.